Welcome back to ABG Invest today. My name is Simon Jonsson. I'm an equity analyst here at ABG, covering IT and uh, gaming. Next up, we have uh, the CEO, the CFO, sorry, uh, Fredrik from EG7, who will host a presentation. Uh, with that said, I'll leave the floor to you. Thank you. So my name is Fredrik Rudén. Uh, I'm deputy CEO and CFO in EG7 since December. I'm located in Stockholm. Uh, I've had several leading positions in mainly uh, high-tech-driven listed companies in Sweden, such as Leo Vega, Spetson and Kinevik, and many more. To the left here we have G. Ham. He's the acting CEO in EG7. Uh, he has a long uh, experience within gaming and finance and has been heading uh, the largest business unit, uh, Daybreak, uh, over the past seven years. We also have a new board, and the chairman is Jason. He's a serial uh, private equity investor and entrepreneur, and he has been doing that since 25 years. Uh, he's uh, located in New York. Looking at EG7, we're an emerging gaming company with proven expertise within game as a service, game development, and it's uh, referring to live service and premium products. Publishing both digital and physical, triple A game visual art and marketing campaigns. We have a solid foundation of recurring revenues that comes from the 10 live games that we operate across the group. Uh, they stand for sustainable and predictable net revenues and cash flows. In the second quarter, uh, they amounted for 54% of the uh, net revenues in the group. They also have very long life cycles. Uh, the oldest game is EverQuest, which celebrates 23 years. Uh, we have Lord of the Ring, uh, celebrating 15 years this year. And also uh, My Singing Monster, who is uh, about to celebrate its 10th anniversary. We have a diversified portfolio of assets, providing an attractive risk-reward balance. Uh, and we have stable and reli reliable performance from the live games and also from the service segment. And the service segment is built on a diversified third-party client list. Uh, we are at a good position right now, but we see an upside uh, on our own titles that we will launch. Uh, new indie game publishing, uh, which is a capability that we built over past uh, 2021 and 2022. Uh, in existing live game upgrades, uh, such as Lord of the Ring, uh, which is quite uh, attractive at the moment, looking at this new series that had uh, premiere a couple of weeks back. And also continued cash flow optimized the group. Uh, and this is referring to that we are about to launch some games that we have uh, invested in over several years. We'll get paid for that and those resources uh, or, and developers, they can be utilized in other ways, uh, such as work for hire, for example. So we are driving the growth uh, through M&A uh, and have had a strong organic growth throughout the past three quarters. Looking at the second quarter, we generated 463 million in net revenue, corresponding to a growth of 49%, organic growth of 41%, and excluding FX effect, that organic growth was 24%. We had an EBITDA of 84 million, uh, corresponding to an 18% EBITDA margin. We have communicated that we will divest our Russian operations uh, through an uh, uh, MBO uh, and uh, we have communicated that we will close that deal uh, in the third quarter and there is no change to that. Uh, this is uh, a picture that show uh, a little bit that we have diversified portfolio of assets throughout uh, the growing gaming industry. So we have uh, game developers, publishers, uh, and AAA um, visual arts and marketing campaigns. We have mobile and we have desktop. So we are all across the gaming industry and the gaming industry is uh, growing over 5% in the next coming years. So it's a good spot to be at. 
having all these assets also mean that we can uh, balance out one single business unit's risk to another, which we proved throughout the pandemic situation, for example. We have close to 700 employees, mainly across North America, uh, UK and the Nordic. Uh, looking at the service segment, uh, they generated 192 million in net revenues in the second quarter, uh, corresponding to 103% organic growth. So this is a very solid performance. Uh, 26 million in EBITDA and a 14% margin, meaning that if the service segment becomes a larger part of the business, then our average margin will go down. Uh, and uh, Fireshine is one part of this. They had, have uh, invested then in uh, digital capabilities with, uh, in 2021, something that paid off in 22 with the launch of CoreKeeper which has since uh, uh, the end of Q1 uh, been sold over 1 million times. Uh, and meanwhile, they established themselves as an independent digital uh, publisher. They also defend their position as a physical distributor with uh, Sniper Elite 5, which topped the UK chart, uh, chart for uh, physically distributed games in the second quarter. So we are all thrilled to see what Fireshine can uh, do with a strong momentum and a strong pipeline going forward. Looking at petrol, uh, they have a world leading track record in AAA game visual art and marketing. Uh, and in the first quarter they launched maybe one, uh, one of the most successful campaigns with Elden Ring, uh, which proved to be very successful. Uh, and in the second quarter, they showcased uh, the leading creative visual art uh, within a project for Call of Duty. And they have been doing the Call of Duty campaigns since start. So uh, they become even stronger in the world of um, with, with cl clients like Activision, Blizzard and Bandai Namco, for example. Uh, so they should yet continue doing what they are doing. Uh, looking at the game segment, they generated 270 million net revenue uh, and 72 million in EBITDA, a 27% margin, meaning that the larger game segment become, the higher margin will we get on average. We have Big Blue Bubble in this, which have never been stronger. Uh, they did a very successful Eastern campaign. Uh, where they increased the uh, daily active users with 2,000% in the second quarter, which gave a, an attractive position uh, prior to this 10th anniversary, which is just about to be launched already. Uh, we have Daybreak, uh, that stands for this recurring revenue. They operate eight of our uh, 10 live games. Uh, they it celebrated 15 years anniversary, which was uh, a success, looking at the highest player count since 2016, and well positioned for this new Amazon Lord of the Rings series. Piranha has been profitable since Q4, uh, and they are profitable due to that they launched uh, downloadable content to the Macquarie 5 uh, title that they launched in last year. We generated 1.7 billion in net revenue LTM by end of Q2, which is a growth of 93% uh, from comparable figure last year. Uh, we are trading without Innova on an EBITDA margin LTM wise uh, from 19 to 22%. This is the new normalized level after the divestment of Innova, which is not closed yet. Then. This further highlights uh, the diversification, uh, where we can see that both segments grow LTM-wise from one consecutive quarter to the other, where game segment uh, came up to 1 billion in net revenue, which is a growth of 118%, mainly driven by M&A, but also strong performance. And the service segment, 708 million uh, LTM-wise, which is a growth of 65%, mainly organic growth. 
We also see that the recurring revenue base, uh, looking here uh, to the right, uh, the, the chart further down, has established itself around 47 to 53 percent. To manage ex expectations, we have delivered organic growth of 28, 25 and 41 percent over the past three quarters. We have also stated that we will uh, deliver 1.6 to 1.7 billion for the full year 2022. And looking at the LTM uh, by end of Q2, that's 1.7, which means that we will not be trading at the high organic growth that we have seen for the first half of the year, for the second half of the year. So looking at the, the business as is, we have more attractive risk reward profile than a year back. And it's, uh, it's mainly two things here. It's one, uh, that we are boxing away the Russian risk. And the second is that we closed down the Marvel project with a very high budget uh, in relation to the size of the company. So to create a new game is a higher risk than uh, to invest in uh, our uh, other uh, IPs. We have a strong record with regards to uh, net revenue and the guidance there. A strong balance sheet with the net debt to EBITDA of 0.3, which means that we can borrow more money if we would like to do that. Strong IP portfolio, stable and recurring revenue, we're 54% uh, as mentioned. Diversified pipeline of new games and content updates. And an attractive cash generation potential, as I started with, with regards to the 250 plus uh, developers uh, that we have in the independent studios. That's what I was supposed to say. Great. Thank you, Fredrik. Thank you. Uh, we have some time for, for questions as well. So uh, I want to start off with uh, the capacity uh, from the in independent studios. Uh, you say you will uh, get once you have released the current pipeline. Could you elaborate a bit about what your alternatives are. Yeah, so uh, we have engaged approximately 250 to 270 uh, employees within Toadman Studios, Antimatter Games and Piranha. Uh, they have uh, launched uh, with regards to Piranha and will launch with regards to the other two studios games within the next coming um, year. Uh, and when we do that, we get paid for that. And we also have then those resources to be utilized for, for example, uh, work for higher contract. But we could also evaluate other alternatives. So we do have a strong potential in increasing and increasing the stability uh, and also the cash flow and net flow uh, revenues going forward. And can you say anything about uh, the current cash burn from those studios? Yeah, I mean, uh, today um, Piranha is profitable uh, since Q4, uh, mainly due to that they have been launching quite successful downloadable content to Mac Warrior 5. And they also have uh, one of the uh, MMOs that they operate, which is Mac Warrior Online. Uh, but the other two studios uh, have uh, um, is financed from, from the other part of the uh, business, so to say, mainly the MMOs and the service segment. So they, the burn rate there, I mean, uh, it's close to uh, 198 employees that we're talking about. Right. And why, why not continue with uh, internal development? It's, uh, we will do that with regards to the MMOs that we have. Uh, and we could potentially evaluate new games, but it's a higher risk with a new game because you are hit driven. And looking at the total portfolio that we have, we, we would like to reduce the risk. And we think that we have an attractive risk reward profile now that we would like to keep. So to start to invest in a new game, for example, is a higher risk. And we were a bit concerned about that. It's more uh, looking at EverQuest, for example, that has been profitable for 23 years. To continue investing in that is uh, much lower risk uh, and a higher risk uh, reward. So yeah. that is the focus that we will uh, be having going forward. 
And, and you are part of uh, the new management team in the company, and uh, you have some skin in the game as well. Uh, how do you think you could improve or restore uh, the confidence among investors? That's a good question, and I'm also one of those investors that have lost money in this. Uh, so I think what we need to do is to focus on the organic growth, uh, to con uh, looking at the fund fundamentals, uh, the profitability and the cash flow generation going forward, and also to guide uh, in accordance to what we expect in a way that we can deliver upon that. You may say that we are conservative in a way that we uh, guide in one way or the other, uh, but we we, we, are, we have the uh, goal to kind of over deliver on what we say. Um, so continue doing that and to focus on the organic uh, in the business, both growth but to also optimize what we're doing. Um, and I think we have a good potential of, of focusing on that going forward. All right. And turning to uh, the profit margin in, in uh, games, uh, you said that you expect this current level to persist. Uh, but what could happen if you, let's say, uh, started with work for hire in the independent studios? What would happen to the margin? Uh, if that become a larger part of the organization, then, then the margins will increase because the margins there is higher than our average margin at this point in time. Uh, it's nothing that we see on the table at the moment, but we see that we have a potential uh, of going down that road. Uh, so that is what we expect. All right, and uh, one more question on the independent studios and work for hire. Would that be smaller projects or would you try to, to, um, to put those developers on one or a few bigger projects? Uh, uh, Obviously, uh, a larger stability if, it's a, if we can engage them in larger projects. Uh, so I guess that would be preferable. But then they will also be locked in. Uh, but I think we, we probably have a potential of, of taking on larger projects um, after launch of the big games that we expect in Q4, uh, for example, for Toad Studios. All right. Uh, turning to Daybreak, uh, maybe you went through it a bit, but uh, how big a share is Daybreak of sales and EBITDA? They are the lion part of, um, of the game segment, uh, and uh, they constitute eight of our uh, ten live games. Uh, and the live games stood for 54% of our total revenue, so you could say half of the business and a, a larger part of that uh, with regards to margins. It's quite clear in the second quarter report, yeah. the exact figure. Great, and uh, what is the CapEx requirement for Daybreak, you would say? We haven't communicated that isolated. Uh, we had a CapEx of 100 uh, uh, million uh, last year. We have said that we will have a higher level this year. Uh, and looking at that we are discontinuing the Marvel project, it will not be as high as we maybe uh, thought uh, when we started the year. But uh, something um, in total, maybe somewhere in between 100 and 200 million. But uh, with regards to Daybreak, they have um, a great part of that, but not all. All right. Thank you. Uh, and what is the outlook for the service segment in, in terms of uh, pipeline, for example? Yeah, I mean, that's very interesting because uh, when uh, Firechan, for example, launched uh, Corekeeper, which was a great success, that's the best marketing for them. Uh, and they have also uh, launched Silt since, since then uh, and have a pipeline in the next coming uh, two years, which is looking stable. So I think they will increase that, uh, but still defending the physical part, because that will be a little bit left over for them to capture. Uh, and that's the history of the company. So I think that is what they will continue doing. Uh, with regards to petrol, they have also, uh, in a similar way, uh, since they launched the Elden Ring campaign, which is maybe the most successful campaign over the past 10 years in this industry. 
Uh, that's a good marketing for them as well, meaning that they have strengthened the, the petrol brand. And we're looking forward to, to see what they can uh, do in the future. The petrol business in itself is not scalable to the same level as, as Fire Shine and the game segment. Uh, so we don't expect the margins to go up uh, from uh, their normalized margins, so to say. Uh, but uh, they have a good potential of taking on new cl uh, AAA clients, uh, which is very interesting. All right. And uh, what is the net debt and uh, how much do you have in earnouts? Uh, the earnouts, uh, we paid a remaining earnout in the second quarter. Uh, and after that, um, uh, the remaining earnout that we have in the books uh, account for close to 80 million. Uh, and uh, with regards to uh, the net debt, uh, if you include the net debt to EBTA is 0.3. Uh, so it's, uh, if you include the remaining purchase consideration in cash, then it's, it's uh, a little kind of uh, liability that we have. Uh, but it's quite similar to the cash situation in the company. All right. And the last question, what do you look forward to the most in coming months or, or quarters? I mean, we have some very interesting projects. Uh, the strong momentum in Fireshine, what they can do with that, uh, what they can do with the indie publishing or uh, digital publishing, uh, that will be very interesting to follow. Continue to follow what Big Blue Bubble is doing, uh, being stronger than ever, uh, celebrating now the 10th anniversary. Uh, they generated 53% EBITDA margin in the second quarter. Very interesting. It's very interesting to follow what um, Daybreak can do with Lord of the Ring. Uh, uh, the Lord of the Ring series has the highest budget ever uh, for similar uh, productions. I think it was. 470 million US dollars or something like that. Uh, it was 25 million viewers the first weekend. Uh, and if we can build the awareness around uh, our game in conjunction to that, I think it will slowly increase the, uh, the awareness, which will be very interesting to follow. Indeed. Thank you, Fredrik, and thank you, the audience, thank for tuning in. Have a nice day. Thank you.